Welcome to Art Bazaar, a podcast that chats with artists of all types to explore the depths of creativity. Brought to you by the Alternative Gallery. We'll be releasing new episodes every Wednesday with bonus episodes dropping randomly. If you like what you're hearing, you can support this podcast by going to thealternativegallery.com and clicking on the podcast tab. I'm your host, Brandon Wonder, creative director of the Alternative Gallery, a nonprofit arts organization in Allentown, PA, run through the efforts of dedicated volunteers. Joining us on this episode of Art Bazaar is artist Liz Ramos, a painter and muralist from South Philadelphia. Liz graduated from University of the Arts in Philadelphia in 2023 with a BFA in Fine Arts with an emphasis on painting. She has a long history with the AG in her building, which we'll certainly be getting into. You can check out her work by going to her Instagram, at Liz Ramos Art. Liz, welcome to the Art Bazaar. Hello. You know, I'm glad that you were able to finally make it because you and I have been trying for the last few months to coordinate our schedules, and here you are. You made it. I know. I, I finally did. Thank, thank you for taking the trip all the way up from Philadelphia to Allentown to come do this podcast. Thank you. And you said it's your first one, so we're going to make you feel right at home here. Cool. Cool. Thank you. You reached out to me last year asking about any kind of exhibition opportunities or abilities to be a part of things because that you had a history with the building here. Is yes. that correct? Yes. That so is why true. why don't you tell me what your first experience was with the building here? Okay. From what I can recall, I have a sibling who visited here once when I was very young, probably came to a the live music events. Yep. And that's all I knew about it. And then I think I was homeschooled in this period of my life and decided that I was really into art. And so I would try and have my friends hang out with me and come to the open houses. And I was able to explore the space. And then when I was in high school, I had a friend who would be involved with things here, her and her family. So then that motivated me to check out the space more and I've just been trying to be involved ever since. And how old were you roughly then? Um, I was probably about 13, 14. Wow. Yeah. And I love that because you mentioned in the email, I went back and reread it just to kind of refresh my memory. And you said you grew up coming here. Yeah. And I love the fact that the AG has been around long enough that kids who were 10 or 12 years old are now in their mid twenties. And to see them going from just being a maybe an observer to an active participant, which you now are. Yeah, this was definitely my first experience of art outside of traditional like museum environments. Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was able to see art from artists that I could actually meet face to face. Wow. So this kind of helped light the fire for the direction you ended up taking. Mm -hmm. That's brilliant to hear. I didn't know that. When was the last time you were here from when you came back last year to get involved again? How long of a period was that? It was a few years, right? Right before the pandemic, I would imagine. Because you used to hang out at the Coffee House Without Limits as well. Yes, yes. Yeah. I have a friend who would perform at the Coffee House. His name is Nate. Nate, yep. Nate Garcia. And he's a family friend, and I also went to school with him. And so then I would come here with him as well. I had friends who had a studio. And so I would visit them during the holidays when I'd see my family. And so I would, again, just visit the space. And event-wise, I think really from me communicating with you was me intentionally being in the space. Yeah, and we got you back last year to do a pop-up studio for the open house. Yes, I, I thoroughly enjoyed that. Yeah, so what was the open house like for you? So I was I felt a little shy, <laughs> but... I was really happy to bring my artworks, my big artworks, and... Some of which we still have hanging up. Yeah, I'm so glad. I'm so glad that you guys of still course. have them here. It's beautiful work. You do great stuff. Thank you. Thank you. I felt really shy at first because when you stand in front of your art and people are like checking it out, when you're a bit of an introverted person, I guess in your head you're just like, well, hello, I did paint these, but a lot of my family came. I have a lot of relatives. Yes, you do. I, I have noticed that, which yeah. they're very supportive, which I love. Yeah, I have a lot of cousins. I, th- I think I'm one of one of like 27 cousins. Wow. Holidays must be wild at the Ramos household. Yeah, it's a lot of people. A lot of people, a lot of food. A lot of food. All right. 
So I honestly, I was shy at first, but then I felt excited from the support from everyone. It was cool also checking out the other spaces. Yeah. Because I've only known a few of the studio residents here. Sure. Yep. And so I thought it was cool checking out the people I'd never met before. Like Chris Jones. Yes. 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 Chris. He's a funny guy, that one. Yes. He's, yeah. That's the first time I met him. Yep. And I can't remember the other artists' names, but... I checked out on that floor. I tried to check out every room that was open. Yeah. So. And we just brought a whole new batch of artists in on March 1st. Really? We officially launched a resident artist program to kind of deal with the need of artists having access to studio space, but that can't go through the traditional aspect of dealing with a real estate company up in New York. Where it's like multiple months security deposit and having to go through all these things. We're making it very, very accessible. So now, in addition to what was there when you were here last year, a whole new wave of artists have just moved in. Wow, I I did not know that. Yeah, and we're going to have an open house either in May or June. We haven't settled on the date yet where it's going to be halfway through that six-month program. So the artists will show kind of like the midterms. This is where we're at. This is our progress so far after the first few months of this program. And if you're available, we'll invite you to do another pop-up studio for that. I would love to. Awesome. That's very exciting. Are the artists local? Yes, they're all local because they actually have the studios full-time. Okay. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, so like the one works at Dick Blick, the one artist, which is awesome because they're right in the heart of meeting all these other artists and pulling them in here because curation is important. But at the same time, if you don't know of something, it's hard to curate it. Mm -hmm. So we depend on these kind of loose ends out in the world finding their way to this place one way or another and working in an art supply store is one of those ways yeah and then you were also a part of the very first event ever over at the golden era gallery our satellite gallery at the america's hotel yes that was very fun and you want to talk about a lot of family being there i remember at the very end it was just me some of my crew and it was you and probably about 30 of your family members yeah they it were. was incredible <laughs> It was incredible. I felt I wasn't even a part of a lot of that. And I felt the love just from what you were getting. You don't have to say it's really nice that you get that kind of support from your family. Yeah, I I, pre I appreciate that a lot. And I wish more artists had that. Yeah. Um, have they always been supportive of your artistic endeavors? I would say my parents definitely when I express that, you know, I want to learn art more. I want to go to school for it. They encouraged me. They really were just like, as long as you were are committed to something and have a good work ethic we support you like as long as i'm not just you know wasting time doing whatever they were pretty supportive and in terms of the rest of my family outside of like you know my parents and my siblings they were just very proud of my achievements that they've seen time to time because i will say i have artistic family members but maybe artistic in their youth and of course they were raising their family so they stop uh, focusing on it and it kind of uh disappears yeah yeah so a lot like a lot of things that inspire me is hearing them talk about i don't want to say regrets but things that they wish they pursued and opportunities that they had they wish they had taken so i think they're just proud to see me do that you know i'm one of the older cousins I've, I've, there's a lot of babies and i think i'm like the second one to go to college. Wow. And the second one to study fine art. I mean, the first one to study fine art. Trailblazer here. Yeah. So I think they're just proud to see like me doing things. Sure. Yeah. You know, you're lucky. I always said that artists are lucky because we found something we love. And unfortunately, a lot, of, a lot of people go through life and they don't find what they love. Or in the case of some parents, unlike your parents, they talk their children out of going into the arts because yeah. you need to get a real job. I mean, I'm sure you've had friends that have been told that by their family members or even potentially their parents or sometimes even their friends. Yeah. And I have to say it's very refreshing to hear that your family members not only support you, but were honest about maybe missteps they took. Because I'm a big believer in not learning everything the hard way. Mm -hmm. You know, some things, yes, you must learn on your own. You can't be told. You can't be taught. You have to experience it for yourself. But if you can save someone the time and trouble, you should. Yeah. And I think it's a big part of why I do these conversations on this podcast is you can get some insight into what somebody went through. Because you've curated some other shows as well. Is that correct? Yes, so I have. What was that like? So at my university, within the painting floor of our fine art building, we had this room the separate room that I was told could be used as a project space. And the second I heard that, I knew that I wanted to organize something. I really just wanted to be a part of some type of art curation. And being a student, you know, 
you're focused on being a student and you can't really branch out. Also, you just don't know. So I wanted to start with the people that inspire me. So I reached out to all my peers that really influenced me so much. I also was interning at an art organization. So I kind of would perceive the the other end of how these things work in a professional sense. Very nice. So I wanted to take that into me and the people around me. So I knew that I could use the space. The space was a room that was an old studio and it was all destroyed. So they essentially put this aside as a project space. And you're like, well, an exhibition is a project. Yep. yep. And that's what you did. You took it upon yourself to make this an exhibition space. And then I imagine, did you do an opening? Yes. To the public? So I created a Google form. I, I emailed it and I sent it to the specific people that I was. I wanted them to check it out and see see what they liked. And then I painted the walls and the floor because all the floors in the building are gray and all the walls are white. So myself and one of my... That's a little odd for an arts building. I know. I know, right? Um, (laughs) I will say the maintenance of that building was very disappointing. Oh, sorry to Um, hear that. I mean, it's okay now. But at the time, there was always stuff happening. Um, Little things add up. Yeah, they they added up. And, you know, like the rain would leak. Oh, yeah. Or like... I've been down that road. Yeah, yeah. And like another one of my studios had a sensor light, and then when I asked them to change it, they were like, no, the city said no. But that means that when you're painting, after like 15 minutes, if there's no movement, the lights turn off. I hate that. So I have to go like like wave my hands. Yeah, that's that's obnoxious. So I myself painted the the room, and I had someone help me who was a painter. Her name is Zainab. She's very talented. And I I didn't know her that well, but she was happy to help me, and we painted the space by ourselves. Then I had the artist come and bring me their paintings. All of them were students at my school, and I included one of my own paintings. And um, As you should. Thank you, thank you. And I hung it up myself. I think I had some help with the ones that tripped me up a bit, but from my intern job, I was taught how to align paintings. Um, yeah, like, flow is everything in a show. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, like the average, like, sight line and, like, Doing all like the math equations so that everything's like... It looks great to the eye. Now, we have a problem here at our building because our building is so old and the floors are uneven. So if you do that, our show just climbs and climbs and climbs as it goes. Yeah. So you kind of have to not use that way. So every room is kind of different. Yeah. We've had people come and try to hang something. I'm like, you hang it however you want and then we have to help them. But I'm sure overall it was a great learning experience for you. And your friend that you just mentioned that you didn't know, Mm -hmm. that was probably a bonding experience too. It really was because I just asked questions while we were working and I don't even remember how I asked her to help me, but she did. And I was just like, hey, I got to paint this room. It's destroyed. It's hideous. And I got to know more and more about her and something about the people within my cohort of students is that they're shy and they don't talk. So it's, you, you all have to break the ice in order to get to know each other. So we really didn't know each other. So yes. Were you in charge of breaking the ice? A little bit. I don't want to take full, full credit, credit. Yeah. But because I definitely was pretty shy. But I will say I it was my idea to bring everyone together. And I had named the exhibition Sick. Because, um, you know, like cool, sick. Dope. Dope, yeah. And I um, somebody gave me a door. And I painted that on it. And for the eye, I put an exclamation point. And I hung up ivy, like, from the ceilings. And the, the studio spaces are similar to here, but everything's cement. So there, there's, like, metal bars and beams above. So I got a ladder, and I was, like, throwing the ivy over. And so it was, I had all these different paintings. A lot were portraits. And um, then, like, the ivy everywhere. And I was very inspired by mini Ripperton's music so there was an opening and another key important component to this is that where the project space is at the end of a long like maze of cubicles of open studios so I had to ask permission of all the juniors if I could have people enter the space and pass their studios because juniors have a cubicle space and seniors have closed door studios so then I had to not only make my own exhibition, but ask others if I could include this and make it like a whole open house night. And Were they receptive? They were, they were. Very I, nice. 
I think the people who weren't there, I just had to like watch over their yeah spaces. So it's essentially a big open space aside from the closed doors. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So and know. being that it's cement, how is sound there? Is it very echoey? Um, a bit. You know, I I. If it's not noticeable, it wasn't too bad. It it wasn't bad. It wasn't bad. So yeah, it was originally just supposed to be sick exhibition of paintings from junior and senior painters, and then it changed to that along with an open house and so i was able to meet a lot of painters that i did not know so and what made you go to you arts in philly to begin with because you're originally here from the lehigh valley correct yeah so what made you go there was there anything specific about that school i knew that i wanted to go to art school because i had attended an art high school but i did performing arts so i actually didn't even have an art class but i like to do art in my personal time uh, I also, I auditioned for visual arts twice in my high school and they denied me both times. Jerks. Yeah, honest, honestly, <laughs> I, that that really bummed me out. Someone's getting fired. That, no, actually that bummed me out a lot. Oh uh, yeah, I, uh, I can imagine. I've been in that situation. Because I had always studied like performing arts, you know, theater. Then I was homeschooled my freshman year and then I decided I want, I do want to go to art school. I want to see my former peers that I had met before and so I auditioned for theater and visual arts and of course I had more experience with theater so I got in for that I got denied from visual arts and then within my first sophomore year at my high school I auditioned for visual arts again and I got denied and honestly my work was not that bad it was not that bad um, Did they give you a reason why or just sorry you didn't make the cut? Yeah, yeah. They just say, sorry, you were not accepted. Yeah, and you know, that's one of the problems I have is that these places, they say no, but then don't give you the insight as to why. Yeah. How are you supposed to grow and learn from that? Yeah. Aside from, oh, just getting thicker skin, which that's kind of bullshit to me. I agree. I agree. It made me really sad. And so then I just tried to learn how to do art from YouTube. And it bothered me because then... You know, I thought maybe it's just a capacity thing. But then there's like new students afterwards and then I'm looking at their artwork and then I'm comparing it to mine and I'm like, I don't understand. Like the judge, the who who the judges are. And again, I'm sure decide. to this day you still don't know what was behind that rationale of that decision, right? I have no idea. And that's a shame. Yeah. Like if we if somebody comes to me with art or wants to run a studio, I have these very thorough conversations with them. It's a special talent in order to tell someone no, but leave, have them leave still happy. Yeah. Have them leave your buddy, your supporter, because you want to be very open with people. You're not right for these reasons because, yeah, we want to fill the place with artists, but the right artists because I'm doing someone an injustice if I put them here, take up their time, their art, which could be somewhere else, which might not be the best fit here, is kind of stuck here in certain ways. Mm -hmm. This information is very, very important to artists, and I think that's a very institutional approach to the arts, which has to be shaken up because a lot of artists in your situation, they might have just walked away from it and given up. Yeah, I it, totally could have. I'm glad you did not. Thank you. Yeah, and when I was homeschooled, I will say my mom taught me how to draw. She was very patient with me. So Go she, mom. So she taught me. She's artistic? Yeah, she is. She doesn't draw anymore, but I do have a canvas hanging at my house and it's a drawing of my sister and i holding hands when we were very very little oh and so she is very artistically inclined she just she's a teacher she homeschools my siblings so she's busy yeah she's she's busy lady. you should tell mom you two need to do a collab piece i know i should i really you should definitely should <laughs> yeah and then you bring her back sometime we'll do a a, a mom and, and daughter episode here with the two of you that honestly would be good. My parents are very personable people. Awesome. I'm the, I'm the introvert. <laughs> well, they, you know, as much as you think you're an introvert, you're very personal at the same time. Thank you. You Thank are. You. Yes. I appreciate that. But back to the school question. So I had this, I know I wasn't a failure or anything, but facing failure really motivated me. You so, didn't knock a home run, home run out of the gate. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and also... Because I was really attracted to the arts, I tried to make friends with a lot of the visual artists that were at my school. And that's also how I became more involved here because they would come here and check things out. I also seen Nate's uh, comic right there. Yeah, my buddy Nate. That was actually yeah. the very first Animation Fest poster. I believe he was 14 or 15 years old when he did that. Wow. And now he's what out in Ohio, right? He moved, he moved somewhere and he's killing it with his comic book. I think Nate travels okay. and he'll go on tours. 
but I believe he lives in Philadelphia. He's super talented. So, yeah. I had. I, I did not just put that there because I knew you were coming. I knew <laughs> that you knew him. That's been there for a while. Yeah. I, uh, I had seen his band perform. He's in a band called Attack Dog. And yeah. They had been on a tour in some states, so that's probably what you saw. Okay. Yeah. So now, you, because you've graduated college now. Yes. And you're still in Philadelphia. I am. What's keeping you there? My community, really. Beautiful. I really like the artistic community in Philadelphia. I'm really happy with the seeds, the small seeds that I've planted and the people that I've met. And I really want to grow with that. I'd really just love living in a city. Do you foresee yourself staying there forever or just, you know, is this this phase of life? This is where you're going to be for a while. You know, my goal is to travel the world. Hell yes. <laughs> where so, do you want to travel? Um, I would love to go to Germany. Okay. Uh, I would like to go to Spain. I Barcelona. Yeah, I wish. I wish I spoke different languages. Everyone in my family speaks Spanish. I don't. My mom speaks English, Spanish, and Arabic. She's wow. a language teacher. My mom's what? a language teacher, but I was too stubborn. Apparently, your mom is brilliant. Yeah, she is very smart. So of course, I know a little bit of Spanish. She's taught me a little bit of Arabic. But yeah, I'd love to go to Germany. I'd love to see the art scene there. I went to Italy last year. Ooh. Yeah, I went on a... I applied for a study abroad trip, and I knew I couldn't afford it. It was so expensive. And I was going to pull out of it the day that deposits were due. And then... And they offer scholarships, but they're partial. They, like, cover, like, a third of it, which still leaves a lot of money. Sure. And... I got an email that said I received the full scholarship. Wow. And so I was like, oh, okay, the full one third. And they were like, no, the full price total. On the last possible day. Yeah. You got the scholarship. Yeah. And it was based off of my artistic excellence. Good for you. Thank you. Thank Congrats. you. Congrats. So I didn't know you were able to make that trip. I'm really happy for you. Thank you. What uh, was that like going to Italy? So I got my passport expedited because I never had a passport. And. I told my studio mate to apply, and she received the same award. So I don't know of anybody else who did, but wow. I know that we did. She's also very talented. Her name is Akira Gordon. She um Japanese? No, 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 no. She's no. not Japanese. Her um, name's Akira, and she's not Japanese. Wow. I know, but I think her parents were inspired by a character for her name. Was it uh, the anime or the... I think so. Yeah, okay. I think so. And that's what people always say. They're like, Akira Lake. I named my cat Akira, but it was partially after the anime, but more so the Japanese filmmaker Akira Kurosawa. He did Seven oh. Samurai. He's like, in my opinion, the greatest filmmaker of all time. Check him out sometime. Just wanted to drop that. I will. I will. I like I like checking new things out. But um, she's a very talented artist and my friend. So I what, told her. What medium does she work in? She works in acrylic. She works in oil. And she works large scale. Awesome. So we... We inspired each other a lot. And, and you had a buddy. Yeah, yeah. So I had a buddy there. And there was other people. There's maybe like 13 people. And of course, our host, chaperone. Um, Your handler. Yeah, our handler. Because <laughs> really, we were not studying at all. She you just, were just on a, a cultural excursion. Yeah, she just took us places. So I was very culture shocked. Because um, I, I was like, whoa. People do not like Americans. <laughs> uh, well, I, it's, you know, right now it's understandable. The yeah. last few years, you know, even beyond that, it's been a little rough. Yeah. So I realized that really quickly. And There's an episode of The Simpsons where they travel abroad and Lisa Simpson has her backpack and she has a Canadian flag on it for that same reason. Yeah. I've heard that. I've heard yeah. that. People say, like, don't say you're from the United yeah, States, yeah, say yeah, you're yeah. from um, Canada. Yeah. Or else they'll They're be like... They're going to automatically think you, you know, shoot your breakfast cereal yeah. box open. They're going to be like, go away, <laughs> Yankee. Yeah. Yep, yep. So it was beautiful, really. And I had gone to Florence. I had gone to Naples. And we had gone to Rome. And this was only within two weeks because it was, it was in between semesters. But it was still like a school trip. You guys stayed in like hostels, I imagine? We stayed... Not necessarily a hostel, but this one place, it was almost like, they called it like a boutique hotel, but it, was, it wasn't it was in a hotel building. We did stay in hotels for like the places we stayed for short amounts of time, Okay, but we stayed in an apartment first where there was two apartments and we split it up and they had a bunch of rooms. How many people total went on this trip? I think like- 20? Like, no, less than 20. I, I feel like 12, 15. Wow. Maybe 15 people, all from different arts 
uh, majors. So all was, from that school or from around the country? No, from my school. Interesting. So dancers, animators, illustrators, painters, because me and Akira were the painters, and maybe someone between that I can't Filmmaker. think of. Yeah, yeah, like uh, vocalists. Oh, okay. Nice I, diverse group. Yeah, so it was pretty cool. So along with getting to know the people that we joined the trip with, because this was the first experience for a lot of us. We were taken to all the cultural hotspots, uh, lots of museums and gardens. Mm. I, I can't remember everything. Yeah, people uh, tend to overlook the art of nature. Yeah, yeah. I, I loved being in the nature, even though it was chilly because it was January, but it was cool. And I really liked being in Naples because our host took us to different places. She would take us to workshops like uh, she taught us a lot of like uh, performance art things, and then after our required things, we were allowed to do whatever. So me and my friends would like check out art shops. We would check out the nightlife. It, it was really cool. Wow. We made friends there. Like I, I keep in touch with people that I met there. And Incredible. It's so, so. What's the contrast between like Italy and America as far as like artistic culture? Do you think it's more embedded in their everyday life more than it is here in America? I think that. My perception is that, yes, they do keep good record of their history and the arts there. But also, I'm very aware that it is a tourist spot. Mm. So I think... Maybe you had to get more off the beaten path. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what intrigued me most was the performance art genre of people and the graffiti there. Whoa. Like, in Naples... There's graffiti everywhere, and there's, uh, like, wheat-pasted things everywhere, and I find that so pretty. There was a train that passed me, and it was graffitied with the Powerpuff Girls all over it. Nice. And I made a painting of that, and I used that within my thesis. And at my thesis, somebody who was not on my trip was like, I've seen that before. I went to Italy, and I saw that, uh, and he bought it. Wow. He bought that painting from me fantastic so that that was very exciting because there's so many train carts how could yeah. you have seen that one in your own experiences so what are the odds right that was cool and something else from being in italy just i realized how much object permanence i had to my day-to-day -day, like living in the bubble of you know i live in philadelphia i live in pa and like seeing how people interact with each other and it made me just want to learn languages and really get out of my phone like really step away from technology yeah and it motivated me to look into like artist residencies a lot and yeah i just really want to meet people and travel the world so it really sounds like this excursion this trip helped you grow not only as an artist but as a human being i would yeah i would agree with that 100 percent. and that's why it's so important for people to travel yes especially artists yes right because i'm sure you came back like what i for me when i go somewhere i want to be inspired and I want to bring a piece of that back with me in some way. Not necessarily to incorporate in what I'm doing, but maybe to make me understand the bigger picture a little bit more and do it a little bit more refined. Yeah. Right? I I wish I brought my Italy journal because when I was there, I had bought some watercolor paints and I was trying to paint and like scribble at any time I could, like nice. if we were on the trains or... Um, oh, that's brilliant. Yeah. Did so you fill it up? I did fill it up. Good for you. I filled it up. That must have been very uh, rewarding. It was. And I'm happy to like keep records of my life. Also, like back to the phone thing, like this is not sustainable. It's a gift and a curse. Yeah. And like everything could like shut down. Like mm -hmm. if we think of like old websites, like you can't recover photos from it. So yeah, I know. I'm happy to have physical media. Of so you're already thinking about archiving. Yeah. Yeah. It's a huge thing we do here. I really like archiving. Well, and you, I'm sure you've, you, you do that because you see how easy it is th for things to disappear. Mm -hmm. And we're so digitally reliant right now that, yeah, as soon as if you drop your phone and break it, nothing's backed up, all gone. Yeah, it's a problem. Yeah. It's a real problem. Even, even like we talked about this on an old episode, things like YouTube, which is owned by Google, they're now, I think it's if 90 days inactive accounts on YouTube, they're deleting it. So imagine some young filmmaker that's putting their works on there, doesn't have them anywhere else. Think about what we're going to lose in time. Yeah, that's actually concerning because I concerning. like to live stream when I paint and I haven't done that in 90 days. I don't want all my videos to be deleted. 
Yeah, that's. I'm glad you told me that. Look into that. But I forget the exact time frame. It might be longer than 90 days, but it's some. They just in the last like two or three years, they really start to push this mm. because all this stuff is sitting on a server, sitting on a hard drive somewhere, and yeah. you got to pay money to upkeep this. So like, well, no one's using it, so we're gonna dump it. Wow. So and you know, for me, I think that art is really meant for future generations. I think it's one of the big reasons why so few artists are really understood in their time. You know, of course, a lot are, you know, they connect with their audience, they find their audience, which is great for them. I'm happy for that. But I think art is really something you're leaving behind for the future. Mm-hmm. And if you're not archiving that properly, it's never going to get there. Yeah. Like, I have my journals that I'll try to write in. This is a new one that I have, so. And you made it a, a point to go out and grab it from the car, so I know it's important for you. Yeah, I I like to bring it around with me everywhere. My sister's a nail artist, so I like to have her do my nails to match my journal. So wow. I have that. That's very specific. Today. That's awesome. Well, you are matching. Yeah, she did it yesterday. We'll I just have to get a this. photo of that for later. Please, please, yeah. Maybe that'll be the photo for the episode. Yes. You, you, your fingernails and your journal. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, me and my sister were both painters, but That's awesome. in different ways. But yeah, back to the phone thing. So from my time traveling it just made me like realize that you know communicating through social media is more like weighs us down more than it helps us yeah like i like it to keep in touch with people that i'm out of reach with but they're far away well you know i was thinking too because i'm starting to do a lot more traveling and like i like dedicated mp3 players but it's like Mm -hmm. okay maybe i'll get one but at the same time i like having less things which is why you have a phone so there is a convenience to it yeah once you rely on it too much you're kind of like stuck on it yeah. Like, do you find at the end of the night, do you do the whole doom scroll? You're just going through social media or whatever and just scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. I have done that. I think yes. a lot of us, we fall prey to that. And like, I'm trying to create new habits, which I've done really a really great job at this year and reading books. I just got yesterday in the mail, I got a little book light so I can read at night and not disturb anyone. Mm-hmm. Like reading books every night. Yeah. I've been definitely trying to read more. Nothing I can specifically think of right now, but yeah reading yeah physical media i am glad you're saying all these things truly it's very important and do you try to encourage others to do the same like collect physical media i would say so yeah. uh one of the times i came to visit i came to a baby shower and i brought a disposable camera nice and i took pictures of the whole night just for fun and i got those developed and they're so beautiful and a specific thought i had was like let's keep physical media alive because i do like technology and i do appreciate the tools that it gives me but i think that from quarantine life it has totally destroyed the way people socialize oh yeah for sure there's a disconnect now yeah there's a the coldness to it even with the whole um like getting this art show together like we were all such shy students because either because we were already shy but also we never got to know each other two years of our college education was online which also that was subpar because i've been homeschooled before and i've been homeschooled a lot better than online college so or even public schools yeah yeah let's be honest even public school yeah i mean the the people that speak the most against public schools are those that work within them yeah. It's really broken. It can be fixed, but it, it requires the right resources and the attention, which unfortunately we're not getting at the moment. Yeah, when I first moved to Allentown, my mom was a teacher at public schools and she decided to homeschool me and my siblings because she knew, exactly she knew, that. Yeah. And my, my dad grew up here, so he had gone to the public schools. And I have relatives who've gone to the public schools and then they change out to go to uh, private schools or charter schools, which... I know. Charter school funding takes away from public school funding. Yeah. Well, you know, so the issue with the schools here in Allentown and places like Allentown, it's it's a lot older than you might think. Like even when I was really young, I was born and raised in Allentown. Mm -hmm. My family moved into Whitehall because they didn't want me going to school in this district. Yeah. So even back in the 90s, it was rough like that. Yeah. My parents did not want me to go to the public schools here. Yeah. I probably wouldn't. (laughs) I but, probably wouldn't have survived. <laughs> but, you know, the, the, the way that we run charter schools as far as the curriculum, like, we need to just transport that over and make that public schools. That's what it should be. I agree. I agree. I'm not too educated on the charter school, public school. Um, yeah, some people get very passionate about that. But yeah. I, I do, when I think of how public schools are neglected and how, you know, certain programs are taken away because of 
funding. Art and music usually being the first. Yeah. When I was in the sixth grade, we all wrote letters to Governor Wolf mm. because he was going to, he wanted to take the arts out of schools. And I literally went to an art school. So wow. every, like everyone in our class wrote letters to say like, please, please do not do that. Mm. And yeah, so. And I'm sorry, but sixth graders shouldn't have to be doing that. Ex- yeah, exactly. We, the adult should be advocating for the youth, not the youth for themselves. Yeah. That's a failure of society, American society at least. Yeah, I think about that a lot, even like living in Philadelphia, because it really just depends where you live in terms of the education of kids. And then. Yeah, Philly has some extreme poverty. Yeah. And then so it's like the cycle continues. These kids go to these schools, then they grow up, they assimilate where they assimilate, and. Just keeps going. The ball keeps rolling down that hill. Yeah. Also, I, I will watch Abbott Elementary sometimes, and they, they touch on it too. So mm. it makes me laugh because it's about a city that I live in. But. Yeah. What new habits are you trying to form now because cell phones you think aren't the one and only answer? I'm trying to be mindful of when I'm distracting myself. Mm. Because, of course, I need my map. Of course, I like to listen to music. And I like to be entertained. But also, when it's constant distraction, then none of it is fulfilling. And I bet you've read this before, but going on your phone first thing in the morning, that's like your first dopamine hit. Yeah. So then your body's like seeking that the rest of the day. And All that's day. why like kids are like just on their phone, on their phone. I didn't get a phone until I was 17. I, I was, was mad. To, I was about to ask that. What age? Yeah, I was 17 and I was mad about that, but I appreciate it. Well, good for your parents because, you know, that's, I mean, even Steve Jobs, who invented the iPhone, did yeah. not give them to his children. Yeah. There's a reason behind that. Children do not need cell phones. And it's just... I saw this video years ago. It was of a baby, maybe one years old, maybe a little bit older, flipping through a magazine, trying to swipe the page and couldn't mm-hmm. figure out why it wasn't interacting with her touch. That's ridiculous. A printed magazine they thought was a screen. You know, because a lot of parents, like, like for whatever reasons, they just shove a device in the hands of their children. This is your babysitter. Yeah. And now you're dependent on that. And to break that... Sometimes can be the hardest thing. Because it's an addiction. It's definitely an addiction. Phones are an addiction. Like, we're honestly all addicted to our phones. So... When you put the information of everything in the hands of a child, I mean, how how do you ever offer them anything else? Nothing is ever as intriguing. Did you ever hear how TikTok is used in China? No. For children, they are only able to see videos of mathematics and science and educational materials and they have a limit of 30 minutes a day and then they're locked out of it they can't use it for anything yeah. here on the flip side in america children see everything and have unlimited access yeah that's obviously done by design yeah and it's just like well and they actually went and they some some journalists went and interviewed children both in america united states and in China, asking what they wanted to be when they were adults, when they grew up. The children in China said astronaut, doctor, teacher, things like that. The kids here in the United States, influencer. Yeah, which is stupid. It's, <laughs> that nothing. Is it's nothing. It's so stupid. I think the most depressed people on the planet are influencers. Yeah, they are because also it's all a facade. Like these, yeah. Oh, yeah. These people are in yeah. very dark worlds. It's very performative. You're doing what you think the world wants of you in that moment. And the thing is, the world is so fleeting now with this bombardment of technology that you're trying to be a different thing every day. Yeah, and it's like you're a person, but they're also a brand. So it gets very convoluted. And then it's even like, just yeah, people who are trying to be influencers, which I won't like knock people who, you know, want to be models and or they want their art to be spread out. I I really support that. I think that's very different from what an influencer aims yeah. to do, though. Yeah, influencer, it's just trends and... Yeah, just trying to get views for no real... Very shallow reasons, in my opinion. Yeah, and like that Hollywood lifestyle, it's very ugly. Like, Hollywood is one of the scariest places. Well, And people, like, when I meet people who want to be famous, I'm like, you realize that fame's a curse. Like, you can never go to the store without being harassed. You can never go take a walk in the park. I mean, even someone like Eminem, he talked about he couldn't even go and use a public bathroom without someone handing things under the stall trying to get him signed. Yeah. That's who would want to. That's a curse to me. Yeah, no, that sounds terrible. Of course, you want to be, you know, wealthy to a point where you don't have to worry about money constantly. You want to be respected by your peers, but to be rich and famous, that is something I think a lot of people pursue without understanding what it is. Yeah, and it's just like the dark, the dark corners of the world. You are advertising yourself for all of that. Yep. So the people that want you will find you. Yeah. And if you're weak-minded, then they'll take you. So, well, And you're encouraging others, usually younger than you, to do what you do. Yeah. 
and like just like different like propaganda things yeah. in terms of anything like whatever whatever opinion people don't know that these influencers are are hired to talk about specific things or yeah. endorse specific things and it's all it's all a pawn. Yeah, it's an extension of corporations at this point. You're just spokespeople for a company that wants you to push their products. And I mean, again, like you're encouraging people to do this, to follow in your footsteps. And I'm a huge believer, as I feel everyone should, behave in a way that if everyone else did, we'd be okay. Yeah. That's the kind of world we should be focused on building. Like that should be our guiding principle. Beyond culture, beyond differences among types of people behave in a way that if everyone did we'd be okay that simple principle would create a much better world than what we're experiencing at the moment yeah like you know post with purpose yes or don't post at all yeah or don't post at all yeah. and i don't know people like post in silly ways and, yeah 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 and and then you know they like to blog they like to be silly sure and but yeah the whole influencer thing as a career works for some but not all <laughs> do you find yourself less inspired when you're on social media more i think that when i am on social media okay i'll follow my friends i probably follow a lot of artists follow like photographers models and i'll see artwork that i really like and i'll save it i'll save it for myself it'll inspire me to work on other artwork but then it's like i've already had that dopamine hit and i don't have the energy to actually make artwork that i like so although it can be a helpful form to study art really it's just a distraction yeah it's all a distraction and it's not real human communication and i think that you have a responsibility within the things that you put out in the world and like once you put that out you can't take it back really yeah, definitely that's very well said yes i agree with that so again i don't hate it i like it i don't it's, on instagram it's, i don't know, on TikTok. It's, it's a double-edged sword you know it's, it's both good and bad it's all in how you use it you know some people call the television the idiot box but I love television. I think some of the best stories ever told in human history have appeared on television. It's all in what you use it for. Are you watching the Kardashians or are you watching Nat Geo documentaries? Are you trying to educate yourself because maybe you're going on some kind of trip that you want to learn more about the place you're going? You know, for me, I get inspired on social media, but it's so fleeting. Like I'll see yeah. something that will like, oh my God, I want to learn more about that. Or I want to, you know, immerse myself in more things like that. But then the thing is, I'm always curious, well, what's next? Mm -hmm. What's the next thing down on the feed? And that inspiration, it's hard to capture at times when there's so, so, so much. So like for me, I use Facebook more than anything else only because I have my Facebook so refined that I only see like certain friends and more so like groups and pages that I follow. So I see a lot of thing about, well, the Simpsons, I'm a huge Simpsons yeah. fan. But right now, like I'm working to take a, a long trip to South America, Machu Picchu being one of the things, the Inca capital, one of the Inca capitals in uh, Peru. Whoa. Yeah. And so like, and this is somewhere I wanted to go for decades, like 20 years now, and I'm finally getting closer to going. So like I make sure in those instances, I'm seeing a lot of that. Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, now I'm able to focus more and more and more. But at the end of the day, you're still kind of subjected to what the algorithm wants to show you. Yeah. So again, like sometimes it's fleeting because I'm just being distracted. Yeah. And I think as artists, like our minds are wandering. It's natural for artists' minds to wander as they should, but you have to know when to grab onto something and hold on to it. Yeah. And with the things that you were taking in so much, it's like, what? All right. You have that and you apply this to towards your art, right? But what are you trying to say? Even if the point is that you're not saying anything at all, mm. but like. Still, maybe, maybe it's a mixed message. Yeah, the social media thing. I I try to like listen to language lessons on YouTube, or mm -hmm. especially last year, listen to like art podcasts. Yeah, talk, very nice. Talk about art opportunities, and yeah, I'd honestly. And what do you do when you're listening to these things? Is while you're painting? Yeah, while I'm painting, when I'm painting at work, I honestly have my headphones on all day. Sometimes I'm listening to educational things. Sometimes I'm listening to a TV show. Sometimes I'm truly just listening to white noise. Like, yeah. I'll intentionally play white noise to focus. Yeah, stick yourself in your own environment. Yeah, because I even realized with music, like, sometimes it's too much where then I'm not even enjoying listening to it. Yeah. I'm really not. When you feel like you need to listen to something. Yeah. It's like, yeah. Like, keeping keeping your mind busy because we're so addicted to the buzz. So I'm, I'm really... Constant external stimuli. Yeah. Yeah, those dopamine hits. And it inspires me sometimes to make art, but also it can just distract me. Yeah. More often than not, it seems for you that's what it's doing. 
Yeah. And well, I know you told me recently you've been you were suffering from a bout of creative block. Yeah, I still am. Yeah, it. I yeah, I totally am in terms of large paintings. I haven't had. I, yeah, I've been like just like a brick wall in my mind of what do I actually want to make at this scale? Because I know I want to paint large, but I don't know what. So I've been trying to get journals and paint in them. I wish I had the one I just finished because I was painting on a lot of the pages. And yeah, I'm really just trying to organically find like what matters to me, what's important to me, and what do I want to create while enjoying the things I like about art, which is the craftsmanship. I really like the craftsmanship of painting and rendering and colors. But I also want to have something to say with my artwork. You want to contribute to humanity. Yeah. So I've just been trying to take in the world and I, you're in a sponge phase right now yeah i i'm in a sponge phase and i'm trying to i've been trying to seek a lot of community within the arts because my only community was school and you know after you graduate a lot of people move away yeah and you realize real life begins yeah yeah and you realize i really don't have much community where i where i live and i did have a little bit you know i had art jobs outside of my school because i you know used to be a mural assistant and i worked at art organizations and made artist friends but i realized there was so much more that i had no idea of and there's still so much more that i don't know um we can never learn it all that's part of the beauty yeah and yeah. that's why you have to pick and choose what you want to focus on yeah and i think with the endless stream of social media we tend to forget that we think we can absorb all things that's not possible unless you, your brain is wired in some way where you have photographic memory and like perfect memorization I think most people are not that. I'm definitely not that. Yeah, I'm not. So how do you deal with creative creative block? I try, I've been trying to take away or lower my success criteria of like, okay, the last thing I made was this piece that I find so amazing, but I don't need to compare to that and stop worrying about like, so you're almost concerned that I'll, your current piece isn't as good as your last piece. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's a distraction in itself. Yeah. Something I had said a very long time ago, which I don't know if I agree with, but I would say, like, you're only as good as the last thing you've done. So I think that would get in my head where I'm comparing not to others, but to myself. Yeah, I don't like that saying. Yeah, I, I don't like it either. I don't like... The way it makes I, you think. I feel like it's very American, you know, and I've used the example in the past where, like, say in Europe, say a filmmaker only makes one great film, one film that's, like, loved worldwide, but the rest of their career, they make kind of bad movies, right? And in America, they become a joke. Because, a flop. Yes. Oh, you're a hack. You're a has-been. You're washed up. You're no, You're not as great as you used to be. And we treat them that way. We kind of spit on their name and their reputation because you're no longer putting out those great masterworks as you once did. But in Europe, they recognize if you ever made one great piece, you're forever considered a maestro, a yeah. master of what you do. And I think like Metallica is a great example, probably the greatest heavy metal band that's ever lived. Now, one of the many subcultures I grew up around was heavy metal groups, right? Heavy metal, like people that went out to shows and stuff like that. We have lots of metal shows here to this day. And my whole life growing up, I heard person after person just ragging on Metallica. Mm. Oh, they haven't put out anything great since their first four albums. Only their first four albums are good. Oh, sorry, they only put out four of the best heavy metal albums ever. Are you kidding me? That's insane. Yeah. So because their writing has changed or isn't as good as it used to be in your eyes, now they're nothing. And thank God bands like Metallica have endured because now they're supported by younger generations that once again love them and embrace them. But not all artists are that lucky. And yeah. I think that's a thinking that we have to change. And honestly, it has to come from the creators. We have to dictate to people like, look, we're not just as great as our last piece. You might put out one great piece and then you might not even paint for five years. Mm -hmm. You know, like I've heard a thing where people say, I haven't touched drugs in five years, but I'm still an addict, right? Yep. I hear people that say, I haven't painted in 10 years. I'm no longer an artist. No, you're still an artist. You just haven't been tapping into that. Doesn't mean you can't. Doesn't mean it's gone. What I've been trying to do is the the thing that's like a second nature to me is self portraits. So in my journals, I will just paint a lot of self portraits. At work, I'll have like little breaks, fifteen minute breaks. I'll try to do a painting within fifteen minutes, and you can see how rushed they are compared to like you know the art school brain of the skills they teach you and 
rather than something precise. It's like very, very quick, very gestural. There's something beautiful about that too, though. And I really like that, like very limited palette. And I'm using like paint, paint waste that I would like throw, throw away at work uh, for my own stuff. And so it's just like two, two, three colors. And I've just been trying to do that. And you know, and I think it's important to give yourself little challenges too. Mm -hmm. Like you see this this sticker over here on my wall above the Hulk figure there. Yeah. So that's an artist named Ohio Mike. He came here from Ohio, just stopped in this place. What he does is he draws the Sharpie without ever lifting it up. Mm. So that is a nonstop line. And I love that. Even if you yourself don't want to do that style, little challenges like that I think are so helpful. Yeah, like our, our brain is a muscle. So Correct. we have to work that muscle and yeah. we have to practice. Try some stuff out. Yeah, so taking away that success criteria of like, oh, this thing was so good. I got to make something else good. No, I got to think back to why I even liked art to begin with. And, you know, we grow and our tastes change. But I know that I still like to create work and I like to have community and I like to spread artwork with other people. And I like to paint my life, you know. In terms of the social media thing, I'd rather be a blogger of the physical world. You mm. know, I will blog my beautiful experience of something, but in a big painting. So beautiful. that's what I'm trying to do within my little journals. And I'll share it from time to time. Maybe you should release a book one day of your journals. I would. Honestly, what I want to do is, you know, when I'm old and gone, <laughs> I would want my diaries to be published. Of course, I edited, but I draw a lot in them and... I feel like I have a lot of stories to tell. So Everyone does, and I think people tend to forget that. Yeah, so I, I want to keep record of my journals um, so that I can just have them in my archives for whatever value I find in them as the years go on. That's great, and I'm, I'm so glad that's a focus of yours this early on in your career, your path of the arts. Because some people, they're like, I don't know, kind of later in life when they've, you know— regretfully lost so much or didn't save so much now you're very early on already focused on that yeah i i don't trust the internet <laughs> <laughs> like, like a few days ago that's why meta was down and yeah. people were freaking out yeah, like yeah, really yeah. you're freaking out because you, you can't go on your timeline i didn't even know it was down until i saw everyone posting about it later i was like i didn't even yeah no like people thought they were hacked and all this stuff yeah. I, I went on reddit i was like is meta down yeah and then everyone's talking about it freaking out but it's like what are you doing on there you're just like yeah it's a drug distracting so if anyone out there has creative block what kind of advice might you have for them i would say to just draw without thinking and take away you know the pressure of what other people think because Something else that is a thing with artists is they don't share their stuff online because they're like, it needs to be perfect. Yeah. And it needs to be curated. So that's something else with the whole comparison online thing because it's a part of everybody's life. Like we are in the real life and then people are in virtual life. So a lot of artists will be very particular. And yeah, that's two bits of advice I always give to people is write everything down. That way you don't have to like jog your memory constantly for it. It's there. You can totally forget it and still access it at some point. And the second is don't compare yourself to others. Because mm -hmm. you're never, even identical twins are different. As similar as they may, may be, they're different. And I think we get caught up and I look up to this person. And if I can't do things the same way they do or as well as they do, I'm nothing. Yeah. And that's a total killer of any kind of motivation. Yeah, insecurity runs so deep with so many people. I think insecurity comes out in the ugliest ways. And the most chatter is usually from like yeah. the most, the least yeah. secure. Those that speak the most have the least to say. Yeah, and I don't think that for everything. Of course. But like, I'm, I'm a very like strong believer of like turning the other cheek and mm. trying to be the bigger person. And do you go for walks? Sometimes. Yeah, because okay. I, I think, you know, part of my advice for anyone with a creative block is environment is everything. And even going for a walk for a few minutes could be enough to get you going. There was a great article I just read a few days ago. It was a new article about scientists discovered that even walking for two minutes after a meal has amazing health benefits. For two minutes. Wow. Just not being sedentary and sitting there all day, just going and walking a little bit how good it is. And I think because we live in a car culture, we kind of don't think about going for that walk. You know, in like a city like Allentown, which is now dominated by car culture, mm -hmm. 
it's not pleasant to go for walks unless you're in a park. Yeah. Walk in the streets. Like when I walk to and from home, I'm crossing, I mean, I'm crossing Hamilton Street. I'm crossing a lot of busy streets. It's not pleasant. It's scary. But I put my headphones on. I try to create my own environment and boom, I'm there. It's healthy both mentally and physically. I need to do that more. Uh, Especially if you have access to nature. Yeah. You know, there's parks in the city and there's, there's a lot of parks in Philly. You know, the weather's been so warm. Yeah, the, the last week or two, yeah. The last few days. So right after work, I would I walked to the park and I had an orange mm. and I turned my phone off and I just kind of like take in the environment and I really like that. Doesn't it feel like life moves slower then? Mm-hmm. It's odd, right? A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Just like taking, just like breathing. Like being aware of existing and where you are and when you are, where I think when there's so many distractions... Life feels like it's going by at a million miles an hour, but when you really just allow yourself to settle in and you can just look around, it's like you feel like this one moment will last forever. Yeah. Right? And I'll feel like uh, this word, uh, sonder, and it's realizing that everybody around you values their life just as much as you do. Like, they're just as worried about the things that you're worried about, but for themselves, so when I'm at the park and I'm seeing people doing whatever, the families or the random people or the young people or the old people, just being around all their energies. Maybe you should organize some artist walks down there. I should. I should. Artist picnic. Yeah. I was about to say that. Picnic. Uh, I Okay. To the artist block question. I have been feeling that way. Other artists have been feeling that way. And today, before I came here, I was speaking with people to plan on working at the same time you know body doubling and making art because i i shared with them that you know i've been feeling very very blocked and so have they especially especially after you finish college because Mm. you put everything into your thesis all your artist brain you know writing your thesis essay about a collection of works and creating that work you put everything into it because that is your the peak of your time in this institution you've been there for four years and you gave your all for this last moment. So then well, and the structure of college is gone too. So it's like having to restart. Yeah. So you're absolutely burnt out and working whatever job you can get. I worked in catering and I worked at an art gallery at the same time. And then when I was transitioning to my current job, I was working three jobs at the same time. That was for like three weeks. But yeah. So after you get out of art school, one, you're burnt out. Two, you realize nobody cares that you studied art like within you know if you work in service which i think is okay because you're still investing in yourself but it's just a different environment it just i think it really takes time to take in the world and figure out not figure out oh why is this happening but okay what's important to me and then just trying to focus on that now you live in philadelphia which has more opportunities for artists than allentown does yes which a lot of the artists here in allentown who leave that's one of the main places they go New York, Philly, sometimes different cities around the country. But even in a city like Philadelphia that has more opportunity, do you think that it's enough? Or do you find that artists are more and more still having to create these opportunities for themselves? I think that artists still have to create opportunities for themselves. Kind of like what you do with a little show. Yeah, yeah. When I was in school and I have other peers who, you know, are able to secure a space and then they bring people together together. And they do something about it. I think that there's a lot of opportunity in Philly, but I still think it's a very competitive environment or very selective. And, you know, then there's the artists who have been working at it for years. So they have more opportunity than you are. So then you're a young artist and you don't know what to do or you're applying to all these open calls and then you're throwing all your money to all these open calls. And then, you know, you might not get into any of them, which I know is a risk. That's how residencies work. You know, you pay the, sub- the submission fee. But honestly, for a lot of my peers, it's really hard. The opportunities I achieved was from really looking and also through word of mouth. But And I'm sure a bit of it is still luck, too. Yeah, and luck. I feel, I feel like a very blessed person. I would say, oh, I feel like it's a coincidence, but I don't even know if I want to say coincidence. I just feel very blessed within my experiences and the things that I wanted to seek out or the things I really needed came to me. And for a lot of people, it's hard. So what opportunities do you think that we need more of for the arts? Like vending? Is there a lot of vending stuff down there? More exhibition space? What do you think is needed? 
I think that open calls for younger career artists should happen more. And I think that younger artists should be actively trying to find community with one another. Do you find yourself having to pay a submission fee when you submit for a potential show or an open call? I have. I have done that. And that's kind of ridiculous. Yeah. Someone You have to pay someone just to look at your stuff? That's crazy to me. Yeah, I've done that, and I've totally lost money. Totally. You know, and that's why we want people to steal our idea of this communal aspect, because one of the reasons that this resident artist program, I think, is going to excel, not just work, but excel, is because these artists, it's not like they came in one at a time on their own. They came in as a group. We have this amazing photo where a lot of them had just met for the first time of then we wanted to do like sitcom style, almost like friends on a couch, right? Mm -hmm. And like the one artist is laying across the rest of them. And it was the first time they were together as a group. And being a group, you got a bunch of buddies. You got a bunch of people that are going to encourage each other. And you don't feel like you're on your own. I think if we can more and more get past this very cutthroat, it's me versus you mentality, especially with the arts. Mm -hmm. I think we're going to create naturally more opportunity for those that need them. Yeah. And truly community, like contributing to your peers and also receiving help from your peers and just, and don't be afraid to ask for help yeah which a lot of people do yeah i certainly am so yeah i think a big thing is community and the whole technology thing the whole quarantine life comparing to the really successful million follower artists yeah yeah these, these impossible goals you're setting for yourself and also surviving paying your bills you know you work so much that you don't even have the energy to create so yeah that's a huge problem so community helps with that because you can still have those little bits of tapping into people in real life and then you go back to trying to survive because rent is crazy yeah rent is crazy and something else i want to say is how you mention artists in allentown will go to other cities and Places like Philadelphia, there are so many successful artists that are not native to Philly. And a lot of the really talented Philly natives just couldn't afford school, had other circumstances where they couldn't focus on art. I just wish that they did have the community. One of my professors really inspires me, and she is a Philly native, and she was always involved with her community and has many achievements. Uh, and she's still, she's like in her mid to late 20s, and she was one of my painting professors at my college quite young yeah her name is patricia thomas she's very talented shout out to patricia yeah shout out patricia you're my favorite teacher i think that the people who have the platforms should utilize them more utilize them more because i don't want to be a complainer and, and say that they're not doing enough but the proof is that a lot of people are not having opportunities yeah i mean i haven't really been seeking out open calls lately because i haven't been creating art so i don't have anything lined up really but it's like the opportunities are so slim you know and it's sad to hear that in so many different parts of the country here in the united states and i'm not going to say what podcast it was but i was listening to a podcast recently it was a celebrity who had on another celebrity and they were joking about how oh all you do is bring on your celebrity friends to your podcast and, you know, he's saying how it's kind of vain. And he's like, yeah, you know, you joke about that, but it's something that's actually been bothering me. He goes, I want to pivot and make my podcast more about bringing on unknown guests who my podcast will help them get a lot more support and attention. I mean, even with my podcast here, we're, we're in our infancy still. This is episode 25. Mm -hmm. We're still just getting it off the ground in some ways. For me to bring in some major guest like a Black Thought or a Quest Love from Philadelphia, The Roots, that would put our podcast on the map in a huge way, which would in turn put our building here on the map in a huge way, which you would have celebrities who admire what we do and want to support and be behind it. Like, again, going back to the resident artist program we're doing because we're trying to attack all these problems we're seeing and dealing with at the granular level of getting people in a studio at little or no cost to them, getting them a part of a community so that if they're dragging their feet for whatever reason or can't get access to something – they have a bit more assistance in doing so. We want to implement a, a sponsorship program where people can actually, people with money, can come in and sponsor young artists. That would be life-changing. And sometimes all it takes is one person with money. Yep. I have these amazing conversations with people. Like, for example, just this week we were visited by 
some people from the Pennsylvania Council of the Arts who were blown away by this place. They said they were actually uh, kind of ashamed that they had never been here before and that they felt it was the most creative space they'd ever been in, which to me was like, that's, I mean, you must be in tons of spaces, but I'll take it, you know? They said, what do you need? Do you know a billionaire? That's what I yeah. need. I need someone with real money that wants to use it for a real cause. Because if you look how the United States spends money, one of the most efficient uses of money is in the arts. Mm -hmm. Because when you invest in the arts, you're actually getting a lot out of it. Maybe not instantaneously like some people expect, but you're creating a foundation of which society can continue building on for the long term. And it's culture. And we all, we historians know that all the most prosperous societies throughout human civilization, throughout all of our time, have invested heavily in the arts, have made the arts a priority. And we see what happens in, in certain cities like Allentown, unfortunately, where they don't invest in the arts. It shrinks, it shrivels, it goes away, or it goes somewhere else. Yeah, and I think that something that I wish wasn't true is that sometimes it's all about who you know. And Too often. Yes, and that something that I really wish I received from the second I started my education, and I only received it in my last 15 weeks, was teaching artists how to actually be in the world. Like, yes, teach me skills. I, I want to know that. Teach me how to complete, like, make a point with my artwork. But how do I even step into this world? How how do I how do I how do you have a business meeting with someone? Yeah, yeah. Because I, I did have a professional practice class. I did, but that was only twelve weeks, and you're already worrying about everything else in college. I think that artists need to be taught how the art world actually works because we don't. And then the people who do had to learn it from years and years of wiggling through and taking opportunities and maybe seeing opportunities that they shouldn't have taken. And I think that's part of the problem though. Some artists go through that and they're like, I went through all this shit to learn what I learned. I'm now not going to just give you free access to it. You know, it's the worst kind of gatekeepers. Yeah. I don't like that. No, you need to be more open and supportive of your fellow artists. I feel. And again, like people should be stealing the model of the alternative gallery. Okay. It's not practical to always do what we do because I mean, we take care of this entire building in order to exist here and have these opportunities for other artists. But at the same time, the communal aspect of what we have here is so essential. Now, if you had the chance to potentially go to school in Allentown, would you have done that if you felt that it fit the needs of what you were looking for? Like, was there a reason you went to Philly over Allentown? I went to Philly because I wanted to be in an art college. I did look at the artists. I looked at a lot of community colleges in Allentown, actually, because... Their credits transfer to the University of the Arts, like, perfectly. Really, though, I wanted to live in a city. Mm. I don't drive. I can't drive. So I wanted to be somewhere that honestly had, like, trains. Mm. Not that that, that, real, that was the real, only... Real public transit. Yeah. Yeah, yeah real public transit. I was, uh, I, once I took the wrong bus here when I was 14 with no phone, mm. that, before I had ever been to school in Bethlehem, and... I yeah, was that's scary. Terrified. Again, yeah. I had help. People were just like, "Oh, go on this bus and you'll get to where you need to go." I was going to my best friend's house and yeah, so I, I was afraid of public transit and now you I'm should, not. You should try living in New York for a while. Change it up too. Yeah, I I have family that lives there. Like every summer ever since my brother was born, like since like 2008, I will stay with my family in New York for like two weeks. Oh, and great. so I have a cousin who lives in Brooklyn now. My family lives in the Bronx, but she lives in Brooklyn now. She's only a year older than me. She's the first one to go to college. She went to FIT. and So she just beat you there. Yeah, she just beat me because she's a little older. My sister also like was always doing dual enrollment and always uh, went to, um I forget what the community college of Allentown is. We have uh, l -Tri c yeah, I think L-Tri-C, um, but my sister was always working different jobs, and then she decided to study, I don't know what you'd call it, but to be a nail tech, and so she got certified in that, so she stepped away from, like, the academic studies, and she's still doing what she likes to do, but yeah, it was my cousin than me, but the reason I moved is because I wanted to live in a bigger city, I'd lived in Allentown a lot, then I moved to Carbon County, which isn't too far, but it's really, like, mountainy yeah. area, which is beautiful. You um, wanted city life. Yeah, I wanted city life. I loved visiting New York. That was my first impression of the arts, too. Outside of Allentown, was my cousin would take me to like the Chelsea area, and she'd take me to all these little galleries and really encouraged liking artistic things. So She was planting that seed for you. Yeah, she planted that seed, and it's like a big give and take within our relationship of inspiring each other. But the reason I went to 
Philly was because I wanted to go to a big art university. Sure, immerse yourself in the arts, not just uh, as a class in a community college. Yeah, and I also had received a pretty decent scholarship from my university. I would say it was probably similar to community college tuition for the wow. scholarships I received. And you're going to an art school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I am paying my student loans. You know, I, I was just paying them. Um, well, if I meet any billionaires, I'll help you out with that. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'll, I'll need it. But it's crazy because if I had paid, if I didn't have scholarships, now that is crazy. And I think there's people who took out loans for that because my school's tuition is 40000 a year. Oof. So after four years, that's $200,000. Oh, my God. My scholarships covered about 88% wow. of that yearly. So the payments aren't that bad. I'm paying them myself. I'm not having my family help me. I, they'll help me if I'm confused, but <laughs> financially, they're not s- supporting. You're their- trying to be independent, which I really respect. Yeah, I am. Thank you. Thank you. That's why I went to Philly, because I wanted to be in a bigger city. But still, it's disappointing that somewhere that I received education in, in Center City, teaching someone how to assimilate in the art world wasn't at the forefront. Again, creativity was encouraged. Learning different mediums was encouraged. Having community with each other was encouraged. Uh, you know, you can't force someone to talk to someone. But that professional practice was late. I'm not the only person who thinks this. Yeah. Well, I think it's kind of us, like you said earlier, I think it's kind of up to us to create these opportunities for ourselves. It's going to happen a lot faster if you and like-minded artists kind of start on your own than trying to convince places that are already doing it a different way. Yeah. So, I mean... You know, we're we're coming up to the end of the podcast here. I know we've talked a lot about the importance of community among artists and stuff like that. But overall, is there any advice you'd like to give to young artists who may be thinking about taking that dive from a hobby artist to being a professional, serious artist? I would say that, honestly, if you want to check something out, go and volunteer somewhere. Go and help out or, you know, apprentice somewhere. I don't agree with students getting exploited for work, though, because I definitely was. Sure. You know, working for free, you shouldn't. But also, if you want to learn about something and you're trying to see community and get to know people, volunteering is a perfect way to check that out. Go to your local artist events, you know, go to Alternative Gallery, go to the Banana Factory, look up online, whatever medium you're into, and maybe like meetings for that in your local area. And any message to maybe Philadelphia or Allentown artists who may be interested in collaborating or working with you in any way? My message would be to email me. (laughs) (laughs) You can, uh, if you would like to collaborate, I love joining people for projects. I think that's a reason that I am a little stunted is because I want to do things with people. I don't want to just do things solo. And that's why I loved being a mural assistant. I was a mural assistant in Allentown, too, on a Fifth and Penn. I helped out with a mural there. So for you, now that you're out of the structure of college, it's harder to tap into that community that you were so used to working with. Yeah, yeah. Cause and you're longing for it now. Yeah, it's my responsibility to show up. And I think a lot of people that leave college, especially in the creative fields, they go through exactly that. I've had this conversation with artists way too many times. So I think, yeah, it's very important. You have to go out and seek these people out in one way or another. Mm -hmm. But again, it's tough when you have the balance of work life. Yeah. So if anybody or if I would like to collaborate with someone, I will always reach out to you. And if you need a painter or just have some type of exciting ambition that you want to take action for, just send me an email. (laughs) And we'll be sure to include all of... Liz's links and contact info in the show notes of this episode, so make sure you check that. Once again, we've been chatting with Liz Ramos, a multidisciplinary artist from South Philadelphia who works in both traditional painting as well as murals. Liz graduated from the University of the Arts in Philadelphia in 2023 with a BFA in Fine Arts with an emphasis on painting. You can check out her work by going to her Instagram at Liz Ramos Art. Liz, it's been a great chat. Thank you. It's It's been amazing. It's been great for me, too. Thank you for having me. I'm glad that you were able to do your first podcast here with us. Hopefully, it inspires you to keep not only listening to podcasts, but being on podcasts, because I think you have a lot of great information that people need to hear, and maybe eventually you'll start your own. Thank you. Because you you have a lot of good insight to share. I appreciate that. It's inspiring. And thank you for making the trip up here. We really appreciate it. Of course. I I was excited. Thank you. And if you're enjoying the Art Bazaar podcast, please help us grow by liking and subscribing to the podcast. We want to reach a worldwide audience to help bring attention to all of the amazing creators and unique folks we bring on. They certainly deserve it. 
And that's all for now. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on the Art Bazaar.